Today on From His Heart, Pastor Jeff Shreve continues his inspiring and critically important series called Encountering the Real Jesus, with a lesson that'll serve as an important reminder that what we do with Jesus determines our eternity. The lesson is called, What Happens After Death? When I got out of college in 1984, I was praying about what to do, and I had a degree in petroleum land management. And if you remember back in the uh, mid-'80s, the oil industry was down in the toilet, and so there weren't any jobs in petroleum land management. So I came home. I, I got a job working sales for a pipe coupling manufacturer. I worked there for two years and got some sales experience. And then from that job, I worked at waste management and sold trash dumpster service. And that was a fun job, not glamorous, but fun. Uh, and I worked there two years. And then I got a job selling chemicals. And uh, my friend Mark Proctor, who was here last week, told you something that wasn't quite true. I didn't sell chemicals outside out, out from the back of my trunk. Uh, we had trucks that brought the chemicals. But uh, I liked that job in terms of the company was a good company. The job was hard, but the company was a good company. And the specialty chemicals industry selling water treatment chemicals for cooling towers and boilers and wastewater treatment plants and things like that, that's just a, that can be a hard job. And one of the things about the company I worked for, it was corporate culture. You know, every corporation has its own culture. Every church has its own culture. Well, the corporate culture at this chemical company was you never talk about anything negative. Always talk about everything positive, and especially when you go to the national sales meetings and you're with the big dogs, you're with the, the muckety-mucks, the sales, the regional sales manager and the, the general manager and people like that, VPs, just always talk about how much you love your job and how it's going so well, and if there's something negative going on, you keep that to yourself. That was the corporate culture. It was a, a little bit of shoot the messenger. If you came with a negative message, they would say, well, we, need, we don't like this. This is negative. Let's shoot you. And then we solve the problem. Well, obviously, that doesn't work very well because everybody deals with negatives. But some people have that culture. Some people have a home like that. We just don't talk about the negatives. I heard about a husband he came home from a hard day at work. His wife met him at the door. She said, honey, I got to tell you something that's unpleasant. He's like, I don't want to hear it. I've been listening to bad news all day long. I don't want to hear anything unpleasant. No bad news. If you have bad news, you can just stuff it. She said, all right. She said, well, you know the new car you bought me? The airbags work. Uh, it was one of those things... <laughs> It, you know, it's, it's tough sometimes because there's sometimes you got to bring up some negatives. We're in a series encountering the real Jesus. And the real Jesus brought up some negative things. He brought up some taboo subjects. The real Jesus, I believe, would not be allowed to preach in many churches across our land because they would say, well, you can't talk about this at our church. You can't talk about that at our church. We just do everything positive here. That's what the scripture says in Isaiah chapter 30. The people said to the prophets, prophesy to us, preach to us, not what is right, but speak pleasant words. Prophesy to us illusions. Make us feel good. We don't want to hear negatives. Well, Jesus wasn't uh, afraid or he didn't shy away from speaking to the people about negatives, negatives like death and negatives like hell. Why? Because those are real things in life. And so today we want to talk about some unpleasant things, but some really, really critical things that the Lord Jesus talked about that we need to know about because these are things that affect us for all eternity. Luke 
chapter 16, Jesus tells a story. We don't know if it's a real story or if it was a parable. There's some debate in theological circles on this. But it's the story of the rich man and Lazarus. So here's our question. What does Jesus say about life, death, and the hereafter? Many things that we could pull out of this passage. One preacher preached five sermons, almost four hours, just on this passage. I want to share with you three truths that I'll try and get in in about 35 minutes. Truth number one, death is a reality of life. Death is a reality of life. Now, in this story that Jesus told, the reason some people don't think it's a parable is because in parables, he didn't use names, and he uses names here. He uses the name Lazarus, Lazarus, which means God is my help, and nowhere else in the Bible is a parable ever have a name, so that's why some people say, well, maybe this isn't a story. Maybe this is what actually happened. Well, whether it was what actually happened or whether it is a parable, the truth and the truths in the story are truths that we need to learn from. So you have here a story of contrasts. You have the wealthiest of the wealthy in this story, the rich man. The theologians call him dives because the word in Latin for rich man is the word dives. So they give him a name, dives, and they say, here is dives, and boy, he's on the top. He's the top of the food chain. I mean, this guy is so wealthy, in such a contrast, Lazarus is so very poor and destitute. This guy, Dives, he is dressed in royal robes. It says that he habitually dressed in purple. Purple is the color of royalty and fine linen. Fine linen was made in Egypt. And he had the most expensive clothes. What has Lazarus got? Rags. Just rags that were filthy and vile. The rich man lives in splendor. Lazarus lives in squalor. The rich man has physical satisfaction. He has more food than he can possibly eat. And Lazarus is longing for the crumbs that fall from the rich man's table. The rich man has honor. And Lazarus has humiliation. The rich man has fame. And Lazarus has shame. And the dogs come and lick the open running sores on his body. Such a huge contrast in these two guys. But then it says in verse 22, now it came about that the poor man died and he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom and the rich man also died. One man said, and it's so true, death is the great leveler. I don't care how much money you have versus what another person has, death is the great leveler. The poor man died and the rich man died. And here's the thing, when it comes to the subject of death, taboo subject, hey, time out, let's not talk about that. We don't like to think about death. We don't like to talk about death. You say, well, I don't know if that's true. Well, the next social gathering you go to, just start striking up a conversation about death. You know, I was doing some research about death. Come and let's talk about death. You know how many people die and we, we want to talk about death? Nobody wants to talk to you about that. They say, well, you're, you're just kind of morbid. You're depressing. I don't want to be around you. My sister, years ago, she went out with a guy who was a mortician, and he was kind of emaciated looking. He was much older than she was, and uh, he just kind of, you know, he, he dealt with dead bodies, and he, he looked kind of pale and, and skinny, and my dad used to call him Dr. Death. I mean, he just kind of walked around. He looked like this, like, yep, I can tell you do that because you look like you're, you know, next up. And uh, anyway... We don't like that kind of subject because it's like, Ugh. so we don't want to think about it. We don't want to talk about it, but we need to think about it and we need to talk about it. Why? Why do we need to think about it? Why do we need to talk about it? Because a new statistic is out. One out of one person dies. That's a new statistic. Hey, you're not, if Jesus delays his coming, you're not getting out of this alive. You know, if Jesus doesn't come back for another 200 years, every person in this room watching on television, listening on the radio, every person is going to be dead. We're all going to die. And death is important for us to think about. 
of a friend of mine, and we were talking one day, and he was talking about being a pastor, and he said, you know, uh, he said, Jeff, let me ask you, between, uh, you know, as a pastor, you have to do weddings, and you have to do funerals. He said, Jeff, between weddings and funerals, which do you like better? I said, funerals. He goes, really? Well, that's kind of weird. He said, I like weddings. I said, well, why do you like weddings? He said, well, weddings are just festive. They're, they're celebratory. They're, they're just wonderful. I said, yeah, yeah, they are. I said, you know, weddings have one thing that can be a real wild card. He said, what's that? I said, the bride's mother. And so that sometimes can be difficult uh, on a wedding. He said, well, why do you like funerals? I said, I like funerals versus weddings for a couple of reasons. Number one, a funeral is not a ceremony. A wedding is a ceremony. And you kind of are locked into how you do things in a wedding. And number two, at a funeral, people are forced to think about death. They can't get around it. You know, it's like, don't ever talk to me about death, but at a funeral, you can talk about death because you're talking about their dearly departed. And you know, the Bible makes it clear in Ecclesiastes that a funeral is better than a wedding. The day of one's death, it says in Ecclesiastes 7, is better than the day of one's birth. It is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting because that is the end of every man and the living takes it to heart. It's important for the living to take it to heart that one day you're gonna die. I'm gonna die. We're gonna die. Important to know that. As one man said, you know, you're not really ready to live until you're ready to die. And if you block death out of your mind, then you're never thinking about death. You're never preparing for death. You're never entertaining the fact that death is coming one day to you. I did a funeral some years ago, a friend of mine, 42-year-old man. I used to play basketball with him a lot. He was a total gym rat. Uh, he, he wasn't all that great at basketball, but he loved to play, and he kept, kept playing, kept playing, kept playing, started getting better. And uh, I did his funeral. Here were the particulars about his funeral. He was playing basketball on a Sunday afternoon and at the park with just some guys, just pickup ball. He, uh, his team went down. They shot a basket. He turned to run down court, and he fell over, hit the ground, dead. 42 years old, massive heart attack. One of the eyewitnesses there told me, he said, I looked at his face as he was running down the court. He said his eyes rolled back in his head. He was dead before he hit the ground. Just like that, boom. That's how death comes. It, it so often comes when we least expect it. And it's no respecter of persons. It can come to the young. It can come to the old. It can come to the in-between. Pete Maravich, one of the greatest basketball players who ever lived, he was playing basketball, pickup basketball, 40 years old, playing with Dr. James Dobson. They were just having fun with some guys. And after they had their game, they had just a little time of just shooting around. You know, they were getting ready for the next game. And James Dobson asked Pete, he said, Pete, how are you feeling? And Pete said, I feel great. And two seconds later, he was dead. I feel great, massive heart attack. Two seconds later, he was dead. Hey, we don't know when death is coming. Death is a reality of life. And the rich man had so much money and so much splendor and so much honor and so much fame, but he didn't have the ability to ward off death because death comes to us all. One out of one person dies. Truth number two, death ushers in heaven or hell. Death ushers in heaven or hell. Now, these men were opposite in life, opposite in death, because what had happened, it said when the poor man died, he was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died, and he was buried. No doubt he was uh, buried and had a big funeral, and they, they gathered, and they talked about how great the rich man was. When Lazarus died, they just hauled him off like garbage, he was just laid there at the gate 
with the dogs licking him. He probably stunk. He probably looked like a pile of, of rags and garbage. And so what did they do when he died? They just carried him off and threw him into the garbage. Well, such a difference in how they lived, a difference in how they died, a difference in their final destination. The poor man, Lazarus, he was carried away to Abraham's bosom, to the place of comfort, to the place of joy. He was carried away to Father Abraham. Well, and this is the shocker of the story. Now, the people that are listening, this is mainly told for the benefit of the Pharisees because it says in verse 14, now the Pharisees who were lovers of money were listening to all these things and they were scoffing at him. And so Jesus tells this story mainly for their benefit. But the shocker of the story, Lazarus, this, this poor, destitute Horrible guy with sores all over his body getting licked by the dogs. Now, don't think that he's getting licked by Fido. He's getting licked by the mangy scavenger dogs. They're probably kind of chewing on his open sores. It's awful. And that guy goes to Abraham's bosom? That, that doesn't make sense. That's a shocker. And the rich man, he, he goes to hell? Oh, this, this is blowing their, their minds and blowing their circuits. This doesn't sound right. Now, something to remember as we read this story, when the Bible says that Lazarus was carried away to Abraham's bosom, people say, well, Abraham's bosom, what is that? Well, he's obviously talking about the wonderful place of the departed righteous dead, and uh, we know that place to be heaven. But see, before Jesus died on the cross and rose again from the dead, th that place, Abraham's bosom, uh, was where all the people went. They didn't go to heaven because they couldn't go to heaven because the price hadn't been paid yet. So they went to this place called Abraham's bosom. It was also called paradise because Jesus said to that thief on the cross, truly, truly, I say to you today, you shall be with me in paradise. So it's paradise, Abraham's bosom. It's the place of the righteous dead. That's the, that's the place that there's talking about. Now, when Jesus died and rose again, then the scripture says in Ephesians chapter four that he led captivity captive and he emptied out this place called Abraham's bosom and he took all the folks in Abraham's bosom and he took them to heaven, to glory. You can't go to heaven until the price has been paid and Jesus had to pay the price. And so here is a time before the cross that Jesus is talking about. And so what happened to people when they died? Well, the Old Testament teaches that when you died, you went to a place called Sheol, S-H-E-O-L, Sheol, which is the undergrounds, the place of the departed dead. And uh, the body goes to the grave, but the spirit and the soul go to Sheol. Sheol is a place of two compartments. You had Abraham's bosom, the place of the righteous dead, paradise, and then you also had this other compartment that was called Hades, it's a place of torment. It's an awful place. One is like heaven and one is like hell. That's basically how the story lines up. And Lazarus is carried off to Abraham's bosom to be with Father Abraham, to receive comfort. He goes, just to put it in broad terms, he goes to heaven. Goes to heaven. This poor man who, whom everyone would say, you're cursed by God. No, he is blessed by God. He's taken to heaven. Now, what is heaven? Heaven is a place of ultimate satisfaction, peace, and joy. That's heaven. That's heaven. You have the ultimate in satisfaction, in peace, in joy. It says in Psalm 16, verse 11, in your presence, God, is fullness of joy, and in your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. He's comforted there at Abraham's bosom. And when it says he's in Abraham's bosom, that shows him, it's almost like Laz, uh, the rich man can see him and he's nestled up against Abraham, Father Abraham. Abraham is the, uh, the brightest star in the Hebrew heaven. I mean, he is the father of all who believe Abraham. And, and this guy Lazarus is right next to Abraham. That, wow, that, that blows their minds. He has experienced and is experiencing the glories of heaven. Dr. R.G. Lee was asked one time by a little girl 
whose mother had passed away. She said, Dr. Lee, what is heaven like? And he said to her, my darling, heaven is all that the wisdom of God could conceive and all that the power of God could create. That is heaven. The mind of God conceiving this place, this incredible place, and the power of God creating that place. And that is where all those who know Jesus and love Jesus and walk with Jesus, that's where we are going. Death ushers in heaven or hell. Now, we like that part about heaven, but the, the crux of the story is not so much about telling you about heaven, it's to tell you about hell. Hades, the rich man, died and was buried. And it says in Hades, he lifted up his eyes being in torment and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus in his bosom. Okay, now here you have this place called Sheol, the place of the dead. And in this place called Sheol, there's a compartment for the righteous dead. Abraham's bosom or paradise. Jesus went there when he died on the cross and gave up the ghost and said, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. Where did Jesus go for three days? He went to paradise and he led captivity captive. He emptied out that place. He told those people, hey, I'm the one that you put your faith and trust in. You didn't understand it because you lived before the cross, but you were putting your faith and trust in God's provision. I am God's provision. And they were able to see him, and he led them to the Father. That place is emptied out. Now, the other part of Sheol, the place of the unrighteous dead that's called Hades, that place is still in existence today. That place is a lot like the county jail. You know, if you commit a terrible, horrible crime, you know what happens to you? You don't go straight to the pen. You go to jail. And you wait there in jail until you have your day in court. And then when you have your day in court before the judge, you are sentenced. And then they take you to the pen. Now, jail and the state pen are really, really similar. But we understand that there, there's a little, there are little differences there. Hades and hell are like the county jail and the pen. They're a little different, but they're very, very similar. And all those who die without Christ, they go to Hades. And they're awaiting their day in court before the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can read about their day in court in Revelation chapter 20. It talks about that death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And everyone has to appear before Jesus. And books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the people are going to be judged based on the things that are written in the books and the scripture says, then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if any man's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Hell, the ultimate final hell, the, the state pen, so to speak, in the universe is the lake of fire. But we read here, Hades is very similar because Hades is a place, as the rich man tells us, a place of agony and torment. Hell, Hades, whatever you want to call it, there's similar experiences there. It's a place of torment and a place of agony. Twice, this rich man, this man Dives, he says, I am in agony in this flame. He, he calls it a place of torment. Two times he uses the word agony and two times he uses the word torment. And Jesus spoke of hell. You know, the Hades is the dwelling place of the unrighteous dead. When Jesus spoke of hell, the Greek word for hell, and he spoke of it 11 times in the Gospels, the Greek word for hell is Gehenna. Gehenna was the valley of Hinnom in Jer Jerusalem. The valley of Hinnom was basically the, the garbage dump. It's where the fire would burn constantly. It's where they brought their trash and they would burn their trash and it burned all the time. And when Jesus used the word hell, he used the word Gehenna to speak of the fire that never goes out. 
That's a picture of hell. I am in agony in this flame, he said. Hades and hell are very, very similar, and it was horrible, and it was awful for him, and play, hell is a place of torment and agony. Jesus said in that place there will be weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. Gnashing of teeling, teeth. What does it mean to gnash your teeth? It means to grate your teeth together in pain, to gnaw in pain. Hell is an awful place, a place of agony and torment. This man was in such torment. What did he ask for? Lazarus to come and just dip his finger in water and just give him a drop, just something that would give him a little relief, just a little relief. But Lazarus couldn't come. Because not only is hell a place of agony and torment, hell is a place of remembrance and separation. Remembrance and separation. The, the man, rich man, Dives, he says in verse 24, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember. Hell is a place of remembrance. You'll remember all the opportunities that you squandered. You'll remember all the times that the gospel was presented to you, but you said, no, 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 later, later, later. You'll remember. If you're under the sound of my voice today and you don't get your life right with Jesus, you're going to remember this sermon. You're going to remember this service. You're going to remember the opportunity that you had that you squandered. Child, remember. It's very interesting about the afterlife. Those who go to hell, hell is not a place of uh, restoration. It's not a place, it's not like going to a hospital. It's like, man, I'm really, really sick. I go to the hospital and I get better. Hell is, is pen for this, the state pen for all eternity. It's not a place of remedi remediation, it's a place of punishment. And you stay the same that you are, and you remember the things that you did and failed to do. Child, remember. And then he says to him, you received, uh, during your lifetime, you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus, bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. And then he says this, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great chasm fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to you may not be able, and that none may cross over from there to us. You remember the, the picture of Sheol. You have Abraham's bosom, paradise on one side. You have Hades on the other side. The place of the righteous dead on this side. The place of the unrighteous dead on that side. And in between, there's a chasm. It's a bottomless pit. You can't cross over either side. What does that teach us? It teaches us that once you die, you are set forever in your final destination. A little poem I like says this, loved ones will weep o'er my silent face. Dear ones will clasp me in sad embrace. Shadows and darkness will fill the place five minutes after I die. But faces that sorrow, I will not see. Voices that murmur, they will not reach me. But where, oh, where will my spirit be Five minutes after I die, not to repair the good I lack. Fixed to the goal of my chosen track, no room to repent, no turning back. Five minutes after I die, mated forever with my chosen throng. Long is eternity. Oh, so long. Then woe is me if my soul be wrong. Five minutes after I die. Hey, you can't cross over. They can't come to you. You can't come to them. It is fixed, and it is fixed separation from God. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, speaking of the Lord coming back, it says the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. These will pay the penalty of eternal destruction. Now, what is eternal destruction? Away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 
That's the hell of hells. You're separated from God forever, away from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. And it's not what God wants. You know, at the great white throne judgment, everyone who comes before the Lord at the great white throne judgment is lost. He opens up the Lamb's book of life to show every person, hey, I died for you. Your name, there's a slot for your name here, but you rejected me. And when he says, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness, he doesn't say it with joy. He says it with a broken heart. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. But lots of people are going there. Jesus said, in the great Sermon on the Mount, how does he finish that Sermon on the Mount? Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7. He ends up Matthew 7 by talking about enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And many of those who find it, but if you enter by the narrow gate, that gate is small and it's narrow and few there be that find that. And he says, hey, there are going to be lots of people on judgment day that say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will declare to them, Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I, not that I knew you once and forgot you. It's I never knew you. I ne you were never mine. That's in the great Sermon on the Mount. It closes with an invitation to enter by the narrow gate. Well, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Child, remember, you are separated. Death ushers in heaven or hell. And truth number three, what you do with Jesus determines your eternity. What you do with Jesus, that determines heaven or hell. Now, we can read this story, and if you're not careful, you can get the wrong idea. You say, well, I guess what means how you go to heaven is to be destitute. And so I better divest myself of everything I own because I, I don't want to go to a place of torment. So I got to be poor. No, that's not what it's teaching. Hey, you know who was really, really rich in this life? Abraham. He was rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold, the Bible tells us in the book of Genesis. He had lots of this world's goods. He was justified by his faith. Poverty doesn't ensure uh, heaven. There are lots of poor people who are with this man Dives in, in Hades. And there are lots of rich, man, rich people who are in paradise with the Lord. Because today, absent from the body, present with the Lord, once Jesus cleared out uh, Abraham's bosom, then paradise shifted to heaven. And, uh, and now when a Christian dies, he goes straight to be with the Lord in glory. Well, there are lots of rich people in heaven. There are lots of poor people in heaven. There are lots of rich people in Hades, lots of poor people in Hades. It has nothing to do with wealth. It has to do with faith. And here is the surprise of the story, as I said, was that the poor man was the one who was carried off to Abraham's bosom and the rich man died and went to Hades and was in agony in the flame. Hey, don't be confused by earthly blessings or earthly trials. That was the, the mindset of the Jew that said, if you are blessed of God, if he's pouring out blessings upon you, it is because... He favors you, and you are in good stead with God. And, of course, when you die, you're going to heaven. That's how they thought. And if you have a tremendous lack in your life, it's because God is, has cursed you, and you can mark it down. You're going to die and go to hell. That's what they thought. And so when Jesus told this story, they immediately thought, well, of course, the rich man will go to heaven. God has blessed him so much. But it was a reversal. You know, that's the problem with Job when Job had all the problems that he had, his friends came and said, Job, you need to confess your sin. You've done something wrong. Job said, I haven't done anything wrong. Well, Job, you have to have done something wrong because 
the trials and tribulations that you're going through, they don't come to a righteous man. They come to an unrighteous man. If you were walking with God, you would be blessed, not cursed. That's in their mindset. That was in the mindset of the Pharisees. They were lovers of money, and they thought, if I have lots of money, then that means God has blessed me. You know, we have a whole uh, group of people who preach in Jesus' name. It's all about health, wealth, and prosperity, and they have the same mindset. Oh, look how God has blessed me so much. I get all these people to give me so much money. It's not based on that. It's not based on your wealth. It's based on faith. So don't be confused by earthly blessings or earthly trials. And don't think that a sign from God, a miracle from God, will make the difference for you. What did the rich man say when he found out that Lazarus can't come over here and give you a drop of water. You know, he's, this rich man, still, he's still treating Lazarus like Lazarus is some kind of lackey. You know, send, send Lazarus, he's the bottom of the heap, send him over here to help me because I'm somebody special. And when Abraham said, no, we can't do that, then the rich man says in verse 27, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may warn them lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. But he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Now, it's never a good idea to correct Father Abraham. Here's this guy, and Abraham says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. No, no, no. That, yeah, Abraham, you don't have this right. I know my brothers, and if Lazarus will come from the dead, then they'll believe. And Abraham said, no, they won't. If they won't believe Moses and the prophets, they won't believe even if someone rises from the dead. I had somebody tell me just a few days ago, they said, will you pray for my, uh, my loved one because they're just angry at God. And they said, unless God does a sign, some kind of miracle in their lives, they're just not going to believe. And I immediately thought of this passage and I thought, even if God does something in their lives, they're probably not gonna believe. Why? Because if they won't believe Moses and the prophets, if they won't believe the scripture, they won't believe if there's some miracle. Uh, the Pharisees saw miracle after miracle after miracle. What did that do for them? Did they believe? No. John says in John chapter 12, though he had performed so many miracles in their midst, yet they were not believing in him. It didn't matter what Jesus did. And you know what is really, really interesting? This is the story of the poor man, Lazarus. And Jesus had a friend named Lazarus that he raised from the dead. He had been dead for four days. Roll away the stone. Lazarus come forth. And Lazarus came forth, rose from the dead, and the Pharisees saw it. And you know what they said? John chapter 11, verse 53 so from that day on, they planned together to kill him. They planned together to kill Jesus. Well, I thought if somebody came back from the dead, they, they, of course they'd believe. They wouldn't believe. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus Christ had risen from the dead, when they heard that from the soldiers, that the angel rolled away the stone, and man, this freaked us out, and we fell on our face like dead men, and they said, what about the disciples? Did they steal the body? No, they didn't steal the body. The, the angel was there. He was gone. Here's some money. You just say that the disciples stole the body away. They wouldn't believe. Miracles don't produce belief. They can help you believe, but it still boils down to two things to get to heaven, repentance and faith, repentance and faith. He said, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent, but they won't. They won't. Even if they do not listen, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they per be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. Listen, don't be confused by earthly blessings. Don't think that a sign will make the difference. And don't fail to understand what Jesus did for you when he died on the cross. See, some people can, the whole concept of hell, they can get mad at God. They say, I don't like the concept of hell. Who is God that he could create a place called hell? I don't like it, therefore I'm not gonna believe in it. You know what, I don't like rats and roaches. But that doesn't mean they don't exist. 
Uh, no one likes hell. God doesn't like hell. God didn't create hell for people. He created hell for the devil and his angels. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. And how do I know that? Because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish in hell but have everlasting life. Jesus took all of your hell when he died upon the cross and all of my hell. He took all the agony and he took all the torment and he took all the pain and he took all the separation as he died and cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He took all of that. Now, some will say, well, that he was only on the cross for six hours. If you add in the scourging, I mean, that's only, uh, and he, even what happened to him o over the night with the Sanhedrin as they beat him. I mean, you're coming up with, uh, you know, 18 hours, 12 hours, something like that. I mean, it's not, it's not a real long period of time. But now hell is an eternity. So, Jeff, how could Jesus possibly have paid my price on the cross when he only was on there for six hours and uh, 12, 15 hours total of suffering. Here's the answer to that. Jesus is infinite, and you and I are finite. And Jesus, as an infinite being, can suffer in a finite period of time. What you being a finite being will require all eternity to experience. Now, when you think about that and think of what the Lord experienced, all your sin, all my sin, all the sin of all the whole world, and he experienced it all to the full in those hours on the cross, the torture is, just blows your mind that he would do that for me. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He didn't want anybody to go to hell. If a man, a woman, a boy, a girl ends up in hell, they have to trip over the cross of Jesus Christ to get there. He didn't want the Pharisees to go there. That's why he told them this story, to warn them. Pilate asked the question of all questions when he had Jesus before him. He brought him before the people, and he said, what then shall I do with Jesus who is called the Christ? And that is the question of all questions. What will you do with Jesus? The song says, what will you do with Jesus? Neutral, you cannot be. One day your soul will be asking, what will he do with me? What will you do with Jesus? Will you tip your hat to Jesus? Will you throw some platitudes around Jesus? Will you say, oh, he's just a good man. Oh, he's a great teacher. Oh, he's just this, he's just that. Will you throw some bucks in the plate? Will you try and, and kind of appease him and assuage your conscience and about him? What will you do with Jesus? There's only one thing to do with Jesus, and that's to fall down on your face before him and say with John, my Lord and my God, to repent and believe, and that makes the difference, and that makes it true that when you die, you will be carried away to be with the Lord forever and ever and ever, and the whole idea of Hades and hell will never affect you, and that is the invitation to every single person. Come to me, Jesus said, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The last chapter in the, the book of the Revelation spirit and the bride say come my friend what have you done with the real Jesus the Bible tells us he is king of kings and lord of lords and he stands at the door and he knocks so here's the question have you opened the door the door of your heart to him in repentance and faith if not today is the day for you just pray this simple prayer with me Lord Jesus I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross and you rose again from the dead. I believe you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And right now, Jesus, I turn my life over to you. I surrender all to you. Come into my life, 
forgive me of all my sins, be my Lord and Savior, and I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this program to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer with me to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number on your screen, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you've messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for you. Find out more when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.